this brilliant new book, the book of Dhaka, which is just out. Um, and we're joined by four people who in very different ways have been involved in the, 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 the creation of this book. Um, we are joined by, starting at the very far end of the stage, by Pushpita Alam, who is the managing editor of Bengal Lights Books, uh, and who is also herself a translator, who's translated two of the stories in this book, which I will be asking her a little bit about. Uh, to her right, Siad Manjarul Islam, who is a professor at the University of Dhaka and an award-winning writer of short stories and novels. He's a translator and an essayist as well, and he has a story in this book, which we will be discussing. To his right, uh, Kaisa Haq, who is a poet, an essayist, a translator, as well as being uh, the director of the Dhaka Translation Center, which is one of the organizations that, uh, that led to, um, by a slightly strange route, I think, led to the, the production of this book. I'll ask Kaisa to explain the origins of this, of this curious thing in just a moment. And to my immediate left is Arunava Sinha, who is a very distinguished, very brilliant translator from Bangla to English, um, who has translated one of the stories in this book and is also with Pushpita, one of the book's editors. So it's a great pleasure to have all of them here. As I said, I want to start by asking Kaisa to describe um, the kind of moment of origin of this book, because it's not, Normally what happens with a book is you end up with a writer who writes something and they find a publisher. Nothing so simple with this one. In fact, um, use my... It is 2016. The Dhaka Translation Center was launched in 2013. Very hastily. I was in Paris on a residency at the time. Uh, before I had left for Paris, um, I had been entrusted with the Dhaka, the Dhaka Translation Center as the director. And, um, but nothing had been done as yet. And when I was there, Kazi Anis, who is the vice chairman of the board of trustees of ULAB, and, uh, the translation center is uh, attached to ULAB, he uh, emailed me urgently and said that we must launch a book at the next Lit Fest in November. To like it's the announce, easiest thing in the world. To announce <laughs> the appearance of the Dhaka Translation Center. Okay. So, uh, what? three stories by Hassan Azizul Haq. Uh, well, there was actually one long story, and um, Anis had found somebody to translate that. So, the draft was sent to me. It had to be reworked considerably. And then there were two other stories. One had been again done by, I think, Ifat Nawaz. And that also had to be sort of, uh, uh, overhauled. And one story I and a colleague of mine had done years back when we had launched a literary magazine called uh, Form, which folded after four issues. So I retrieved that <laughs> and put the three together to make a, a volume that would not look too slim, a slim volume that would not look you know, attenuated <laughs> completely. <laughs> so uh, that was launched at the 2013 Lit Fest here. And when that happened, Emma, uh, uh, Emma De Costa of Commonwealth Writers was uh, a visitor to, to that Lit Fest. She was wandering around. She saw that there was a Dhaka Translation Center being launched and she got in touch with me. She said that, look, we are looking for partners. We want to uh, collaborate with people, organizations which are uh, involved in promoting translation, literary translation. So that began uh, a fairly long-term uh, partnership because it's um, lasted so long and I think it will continue. Um, what she proposed is to have a couple of workshops um, and on the basis of those workshops to produce a book. Uh, in the meantime, she had arranged a, um, a visit for me to the BCLT, which Daniel was running at the mm -hmm. time at uh, EVA, the University of East Anglia. It was uh, the summer summit of translators. So all the people who were, th were there were experienced translators. And Arunava had gone as a specialist. He conducted a workshop mm -hmm. or two. So um, 
I linked up with Arunava. Emma, uh, again, played a key role there. And we decided to have Arunava as a partner of DTC in organizing the uh, workshops. Now, these workshops um, have been uh, sort of uh, 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 sort of create a, a certain pattern ha has been created um, by BCLT, and I think Daniel had a role in that. So um, it's very interesting that the workshop lasts for one week. There is a person, a specialist, guiding it. So Arunava would guide it. We invited applications and selected ten participants and an author masochistic enough to make himself or herself available at the workshop and have all kinds of odd questions thrown at her. Or it's him. brutal. You have no idea. <laughs> okay. I believe that author is here in the audience. Shaheen Akhtar, are you here? She was here. She'll be. She'll come. She'll come. Don't worry. And Shaheen agreed. So we selected a story of hers. She sat through many hours, on several, a number of days, out of the five days. And the uh, Arunava and his team went through the story sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, line of dialogue by line of dialogue, questioned her innumerable times, and as this was going on, I mean, she was not only squirming, but seemed to be liking it. <laughs> because she later Writers on, are very strange, though. You know, because she later on said, you know, I had never thought about these things. Huh. It's, it's going to help me a lot, you know? <laughs> so when I revise the story, it'll be a very different, quite a different one from the version that has been published. Um, and one of the things that we uh, talked about is the absence of uh, serious editing in the Bengali publishing yeah. traditions. And all. But after that story was done, this is one sev uh, seven day session uh, in the first year. Then we decided to uh, assign a story each to the 10 participants. They would work on them, be in touch with Arunava and us, and over the year, they would, uh, the outcome would be a collection of 10 stories. But we wanted a publisher. Bengal Lights Books, which is our partner, can publish here. We wanted a UK publisher mm -hmm. as well. And there, now this is interesting. Emma de Costa looked around. No one was interested. Finally, she found Ra Page of Comma Press who was quite enthusiastic, but there was one catch. Comma Press publishes books of stories set in different cities. So she, they have a book of, uh, the book, Rio, of book of Rio, book know? of Gaza, book of uh, Ten Stories, Tokyo. Gaza, like, things like that. So we had to then change the initial selection <laughs> and find 10 stories set in Dhaka. I'll come back to that question later, but I think it's quite interesting that the, the, the process of deciding what goes into a book like this and what, and what that selection tells you. But I remember what we're hearing is, is one of the things that makes this a very curious project. I mean, I'll ask Pushpita in a moment to talk about her experience of being in those workshops. But the very fact that the book comes out of a project which has developed to train translators, essentially. One of the things we, we had, there was a panel on this stage yesterday, three of us were speaking, and one of the things we talked about was a need for there to be more really good translators from Bangla into English. And this book, or another, is almost part of, uh, it's part of a training program. It's a celebration of great writers, but it's also itself a device for training translators. Yes, and that uh, certainly makes it one of the most, possibly one of the most unique uh, books of translation in the world, I imagine. And um, apart from anything else, I think it's fantastic for workshop participants to know that their work is actually going to be part of a printed book so early on in their careers. It's, it's a great Philip and great um, incentive to carry on working, as you know, mm -hmm. without money or without any real um, fame or glory other than purely for the love of it. 
they get to be on stage at the Lit oh, Fest? Yeah, I feel yeah. very do. famous we, right now. We do. And at like some 55 minutes. And at some point, we must also ask those of them who are present to take a bow. Yes, we'll, we'll, yes. we'll, take a, we'll have a curtain call for the other writers. So I know that there are some, some others in this room. Pushpita, will you describe that experience? When Kaiser was talking about that workshop format, where you have the writer there, and are enough are leading the first workshop, and, and you're doing that kind of relentless, you know, you're <coughs> arguing about every syllable and every piece of punctuation. What's that like for the, the participant? I mean, because it sounds like it's either profoundly boring or completely thrilling, depending on if you're a kind of weird person who likes the same things that we like. <laughs> like um, commas and semicolons yeah. and things. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, it was both, I think, uh, in turn, I think. Um, I have some of my fellow inmates here <laughs> with me. Um, I think what uh, would give you an idea of how it was um, is if I tell you how much we got through in uh, five days. Think about it, it was about half a page. Mm -hmm. So we basically- o On the better days. On the, yes. yes. And we fought over every word, every punctuation mark. But I think it was thrilling because you, when you're doing it on your own, you tend to see it very, uh, you know, in, in a myopic way. But mm -hmm. I think when you see all these different perspectives, and, and most of them you don't perhaps agree with, but it's, it just opens you up to so many pos possibilities in translation. It also obliges you to articulate the, the things that you're, because when you're translating, as you said, you have this kind of focused view, of this piece of work you're producing. And in the same way that Kaiser described the writer being asked lots and lots of questions, why did he use this word? As a translator in that collaborative process, you kind of have to do the same. Absolutely. Because if you've decided to use, if you have a sentence with, you, you know, you want to put a comma in the sentence, and I don't want to put a comma in the sentence, which is unlikely because I almost always want to put commas in sentences, <laughs> but in this weird hypothetical universe, you have to persuade me somehow by articulating what you're doing that there is a reason for this comma to be there, which is something that when you're working on your own, you don't have to, yeah. you don't have to articulate that, right? Exactly. And sometimes that's not, not the best way. But you know, when you have 10 people in a room fighting over everything, I think what comes out is probably the best product possible. Right. Let's, let's get, move on to this question. Before we talk about a particular story, because I want to talk about the weapon specifically. But before we talk about that, this question of how you choose what the stories are going to be, uh, in this collection. Kaisa, you said something about having to move from your original idea to, to choose these uh, stories that all have something to do with Taka to fit that pattern that the publisher has, the book of Taka. Was it an easy thing to do? Is there a lot of, you know, is a lot of what's happening that's interesting in writing in Bangladesh, is it urban? Is the tradition? I mean, how hard is that decision to make? Well, I mean, there are a lot of stories set in Dhaka and uh, and perhaps more in the small towns and uh, in the countryside. Um, but uh, you see, in uh, putting together an anthology, it's uh, more, more than, than it's, it's not just the quality of the stories that you have to consider, because you have to think of um, in the 10 stories, and um, none of them should be in, in length, sort of should, should in length overpower the others. You know, it's sort of more or less, you know, uh, within a certain range, mm -hmm. uh, and then covering various aspects of uh, life in this city and also um, various key aspects in the history of this city. So these are the things we had at the back of our mind. Because you had to yes. think about people reading them as a collection of 10, yes. not just right. enjoying not one individual story. Exactly. I want to talk about one individual story since we have with very, very pleased to have one of the writers here with us. Um, and it would be nice to give an example for you to have a sense of what one of these stories was like. The Weapon is, it's a kind of story about uh, a young man's loss of innocence in this, in this difficult place. But I wonder if you can say something first about, I suppose about the origins of this story and what it was you, you started with. I think some writers start with a character or a real person or a scene or a title or a what, can you say what it was that this story came out of? All right, I, <clears throat> for my themes of my story, I go to the newspapers, I listen to people's stories. Mm -hmm. I have students from all over Bangladesh, they all t tell me about stories of their lives. And sometimes I depend on journalists. Surprisingly, they are one of the best sources of stories. <laughs> <clears throat> this story I picked up from a, a student of mine who was a journalist. This was about a boy 
was waiting for sentencing in a court of law. And he had obviously met the boy and felt the pain because as you said, this is the story of lost innocence. I went to the court and the boy did not want to open up to me. He thought I was one of them. Mm -hmm. But maybe because I'm a teacher, I have a sympathetic voice sometimes. <laughs> so eventually he opened up and started talking about his life. So it did not begin from a project. And I, mean, I usually don't pluck my stories from thin air, as they say. <laughs> I like to relate to life, and uh, even if I have imagined a story, I would like to mix up events from real life uh, and uh, introduce some kind of disbelief in the shape of supernatural events. Um, sometimes I have supernatural interventions. Because if you look at people's lives, they do believe in these things. I also have grounded my stories in the folk tradition of storytelling. And the benefit of borrowing from storytelling tradition is that space is shared by the narrator and the listeners. So the, the wall between, the glass wall between the narrator and the audience is broken. And there is an open participation by the audience. This I feel very rewarding. And when I talked about this boy's story, I like to imagine that people are sitting out there who are reading my story from a safe distance, who do not know anything about what happens in this city of Dhaka in its great underbellies. The drug lords, for example, mm. the gun runners, and politi political thugs. They rule this underworld. And they regularly uh, induct ad ad adolescents, because they're the most expendable, of course. Uh, into their trade. And this boy, his name is Ponir. And that's a real life name, but not yeah. that boy's name. Yeah. Uh, I have all the respect for the boy. I didn't want him to mm. uh, be projected as somebody uh, who has a negative image. But that boy, who I met in the court, First of all, he has lost his innocence. He was trying to be more macho than macho in the man's world. And he has, he has obviously been trained in the use of weapons. And I did not, or I couldn't guess whether he was into drugs, but that goes hand in hand. And I saw this story as a kind of a representative tale mm. of families who suffer, who sacrifice so many things uh, as they go through life. And it's a very uh, painful story. I, I felt tremendous amount of sympathy for mm -hmm. the boy. But fortunately, the boy was sentenced in a very light, given a very light sentence. I suppose the uh, judge sitting there, maybe he had been <clears throat> a teacher in one of his lives, mm -hmm. but he was very sympathetic to the boy. I don't know, frankly speaking, I don't know what happened to the boy. I couldn't keep track, mm -hmm. track of him. But I know boys like these sure. never come back to life. If they do, they do in such different disguises mm -hmm. that their real self gets lost behind the disguises. Um, so that's my story. Thank you. I, I want to come back in a moment to something you said about the sort of the way the story is told, that kind of storytelling voice and the tradition that I think it's a part of. But I wanted to ask you first a question which I suppose is a question about, about process, probably more than anything. Getting from this young man you're talking to, who is a person in the real world, to a 20-page work of something that's presented as fiction, that is constructed, beautifully put together. Can you say something about the, whether there is a moment as a writer that you know the shape of the thing? Because the story, obviously, it's, it's, a, it's sort of about reality, but it's also, it's a constructed thing. And so I wonder whether, is the writing itself, is that part of, I mean, do you discover things by writing, or do you have a very clear sense of what you're doing? Everything kind of takes shape, and it's only then that you actually put it down on paper. It's a difficult question, Ria. Really. I never thought about my, the way I write a story or construct a story. Mm. But first of all, I think about a theme. Because from a newspaper, a story stares at me a separation somewhere, a heartbreak somewhere else, um, something very strange happening, like as it happens in 
magic realist fictions, right? Um, so oh, these things, if, if they strike me, mm. then I preserve them in some part of my brain. I don't know where, inside the skull of my head, maybe. And eventually, one event, another event, they link up. But that happens d during the process when you're writing. That's the process of writing the right. story. And the rest is chemistry. Right. I don't know where these dialogues come to me. Mm. But as the story begins, uh, I do not have a, an end in sight. That's, that's what I was like, curious about. It's yeah. almost like getting into a tunnel, mm -hmm. hoping that there will be light at the end of the tunnel. There is usually a light in the, mm. at the end of the tunnel. And sometimes there is a moment in the story. I believe that every literary work to be worth must deal with moments, a moment when things come together. Mm -hmm. um, I hate to use the word epiphanic moment, yeah. but uh, being trained into literary criticism, probably I'll do that. Mm. But that's the moment when the story hangs in a balance. Whether this becomes a reportage, a newspaper article, or a code document, in this case of the boy, or a real story, depends on the particular moment, how it unfolds. For me, the moment came when the boy was made to make a choice. He had a book who, is, who he got in school for punctuality, a book of memorable sayings. He almost memorized the whole book. That was his most prized possession. Mm -hmm. And when he had to leave school, he had to keep the boy safekeeping, the book in safekeeping. And then he got a gun as well. At the very end of the story, the boy was going away into the night to take revenge for his master's death. And he was also going to meet the girl who he had newly discovered in his life. And he started at 10 or 10 at night, his little trip to these destinations, with one book, with a packet in one hand, a, a, a containing the yeah. book, a polythene packet, another polythene packet containing the gun. And now along the way, there was a manhole Dhaka was famous for his manholes 20 years back, not anymore. Hmm. And the boy throws one packet into the manhole. I frankly don't know which one. Which I was going to ask you that question. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> it's one of those things that I think we always assume as readers, that writers are just keeping secrets from us, but you all know. But in a way, one of the reasons I was asking about that, uh, about that kind of process of discovering while you're writing was precisely because of that ending. Because the the narrative voice, this kind of storytelling voice, feels very much in control and even says things like, of course, what was going to happen later is, so it feels like this whole thing is, is inevitable, if you like, there's this process yeah, That's the storytelling tradition. Yeah. Uh, in my childhood, I listened to this, uh, this fantastic woman who used to tell us stories and she was a great spinner of the tale and we all sat mesmerized when she was telling a story in the middle of everything, she would go into the ritual of you know, preparing a pan, you know, the chewable thing, suspending us in great balance, and we were just waiting there for the story to begin impatiently. <laughs> then the moment we say, where is the story? She would say, no story is lost in life. Just wait. And sometimes she gave us the option to construct our own endings. <laughs> you know, this prince coming with a winged horse trying to rescue the uh, princess. Well, I once killed the prince, and all my friends were jumping on me, <laughs> murderer and all that. She intervened. She said, well, in real life, princesses get killed. Mm -hmm. Princesses, too. So that's the kind of lesson I learned from you were, you were ob even At that age, you were obviously going exactly. to be a writer. So <laughs> predicting, what is <laughs> I, predicting what is going to happen mm. is part of the storytelling tradition. You know, it's like Shakespeare's plays. Everyone knows the ending. Yes. But the story is in the telling. Mm -hmm. Every telling spins a second story. A third story is also comes. And between second and third and the first, there is a whole world of difference. Depends on who is telling the yeah. story. So I, I humbly believe that I belong to this tradition of storytelling. That's why I am always myself in the story. I become a part of the story itself. I do not keep an omniscient narrator's Mm. in a very uh, hallowed position. I become a part of the story itself. Sometimes in, the, in one of my novels, at one time I forgot the name of my story, of the character. And people ask me, uh, how did you forget your character's name? 
I said, in real life, do you always remember people's names? <laughs> in one of my novels, there are three characters of the same name. I can challenge you, no other book in the whole world has three characters with the same name. Somebody was so angry and asked me, why did you do that? I said, in your neighborhood, don't you have other two persons with your same name? <laughs> Urunavo is a friend of mine, and we have, I have three friends whose names are Urunavo. <laughs> so I tell them, if in your neighborhood, there are three characters with the same name, well, my book of is course. bigger than the neighborhood, for God's sake. <laughs> Otherwise, why do I write? It does make sense. I'm not sure. I, I know publishers who wouldn't completely agree with you, but I, under, I, I understand the logic. But I, I have some crazy publishers <laughs> some who go along with me. That's yeah, the, I, I, the best I'm, thing. That I'm I just thinking of the markups. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I want to ask Aaron, following on from, from that, thing, that point, actually, the, the, the question about, I suppose, how a story is told and how it changes, and exactly what you were saying, and the story gets retold by different people and adapted slightly, what you were describing about you, yourself as a young person taking control of the story. One thing that obviously happened to the story that is very peculiar is translation happened to it. Translation's a very strange thing, as we all know. And one of the things it means is that without presumably, I assume you didn't decide to change the ending and do dramatic things like this, you kept, it, you kept a close eye I'm on so him. I'm so grateful that Orunavo decided to translate it. I didn't have to go through Shahin Akhtar's fate. You know, <laughs> translators throwing me uh, questions like a ton of bricks. He did it, and he did a marvelous you didn't, job. And, and you didn't ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> but what, can you say something about, about that? When we were talking about things like the, the storytelling, that storytelling voice, can you describe that, that, that sort of the finding of the voice in a translation, especially something like this, which is it's quite a distinctive yes, yes, spoken voice? Yes, but you know that, Danny. I mean, you, you, you work very closely with the original text, and you're not overthinking it initially. Mm. But the beginning is important. And when you discern a very strong voice in the narration, then you are working, you're making sure that you've started the story with the right voice. And once you've got that, then you move very quickly because you know you've sort of captured it. It is your um, uh, judgment as to whether you've got it or not. But at least you're, you're trying to get something unique and not just sound like any other uh, storyteller. And also this particular story, of course, as a translator, I, I, so I have this practice of sometimes not reading a text before translating it. Do you do that as well? I, I try and avoid reading things before I translate. Yeah, exactly. Novels, stories, anything. Yes, That's yes. my preferred way of working. Yes, exactly. So there's this joy of discovering the text as you're translating, exactly. and sometimes you're torn between translating and, no, I want to read on. So that's when you know it's, you're really into it. Yeah. And I think you'll agree, really good literature translates itself almost. It, yeah. it, it's, it's much easier to translate when the original is great writing. Yes, I completely agree. Well, Pushpita, what Aaron Ava was just saying was something about trying to find a voice that's distinctive so it doesn't sound like anything else. That's some, when, when he was describing that, kind of finding that first thing. Um, you have two stories in this, as a translator, two stories in this collection. Would you say something about, about for people who don't know the stories, about those two stories, but also whether they had, whether they had different challenges or whether, whether it was difficult to make them because they have to feel like they're by two different writers, yes. even um, though they're both sort of by you. Um, Translation I is did, really uh, weird. The Raincoat by Akhtar Zaman Elias, <laughs> which actually was a story I was in love with. So, and the other story I did was uh, Decision by Farvez Hussain. And uh, I was lucky because they were very uh, different uh, in terms of the way they were structured. Um, Raincoat was kind of like a stream of consciousness story, whereas this Decision was very much uh, dialogue heavy. It was very based on dialogue. So it was a little bit easier to sort of bring through voice because it was in one story it was mainly the voice of the two characters having that conversation with the backdrop of the Vuimela. And in the other story it was mainly the protagonist who in the Bangla version it remains unnamed till the very end. Um, which which is something the yes. editor, that, that Ra was not happy about. And, yeah, so, we don't agree with that. Yeah, like, like the habit of th uh, three characters with the same name. Here, Ra said, can't, can't we just name him up front? And I'm like, but you know, if the author didn't, then maybe we shouldn't. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you a question about that in a moment. I'm writing this. I've written down editing because I absolutely am convinced I'm going to agree with Ra and not with either of you. But we'll save that for a moment. I'm sorry, keep going. No, I mean, I, it, my, my job was made it easy by the, the nature yep. of the stories themselves. So right. I didn't really have a challenge. But um, I think in one of the stories, I didn't have a, an author to sort of <laughs> ask questions from. 
So that was, you know, in a way it's intimidating, but uh, when you know that the author is going to read the story, but also, you know, you have a sort of backup. So I, I had both in, you know, uh, the, uh, one of the stories, uh, Actors on Elias is no longer living. So um, the rest of our authors um, read the story, so they gave feedback. I had, you know. And is that part, that part of the process is presumably nerve wracking, but also? Absolutely, yes, yes. Are either of your authors in the room at the moment? We have one here and one in the audience, I think. Uh, do we have more Chinese, authors? Yeah. Yes, China is China. here. But the ones you translated? No, no. Ah, then, not here. then we can speak frankly then. <laughs> yes. But they were helpful and they were lovely and they were completely amenable and we have yes. nothing bad to say about them, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not how on translators stage. normally talk about their writers, yes. Yeah, nothing's on stage, yeah. Let me, ask, let me pick up on that thing which you mentioned earlier uh, about editing, and I don't really e even know who this is a question for. Kaiser said something at the very beginning of our conversation about there being a lack of editing in certain kinds of uh, publishing worlds. And I wonder to what extent that, that's one of the kind of tensions you have in this thing which is an international project with participants from different countries, that one of the things that is a, that is a clash is the assumptions about what an editor can do with a writer's text. Because when Aaron Alva said a moment ago, um, you know, maybe the writer did this and so we should leave it, we, m I think we are much less respectful, not exactly respectful, but I don't think, it's very unusual to hear a, a publisher say anything like that in, in the English speaking world. Um, because writers are allowed to be wrong sometimes. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you don't tell any writers because they are all geniuses and always right. But there is an assumption, I think, this kind of individual genius that you can't possibly tamper with what they've done. But I'm interested that that was a, that was a kind of point of tension, not tension, but there was a kind of point of conflict in the way the two of you were thinking about the editing process. And Ra was thinking about the editing process as a much more what, interventionist thing? Yes, well, I, I, I would also, and I did eventually defer to Ra's judgment, and the reason for that was that we were both very close to the story. So perhaps we understood the story um, uh, much more than a reader would coming on, to on it first cold. Account, yeah. And so we tr trusted Ra to represent the cold reader's point of view. And if it was confusing to him, then it made sense too. But that's almost always what we expect a, 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 an editor to do in the English speaking yeah. world. That, that one of the reasons you want them to edit something yes. is yes. because they can read it first and be a sensitive and well-informed and articulate. Yes. yes, unfortunately in this case at least I had read the story earlier and you know, several times earlier because I'm, I'm quite a, a fan of Elias's, so hmm. that made it a little difficult I think. I have a, a question which will possibly seem like a slightly strange question and I apologize. I don't really apologize. I, I'm, I'm going to ask this question anyway. <laughs> I, have, I make no apology at all for this question. I want to ask a question about endnotes. The stories have, in some cases, quite a lot of notes at the end explaining things. Push me to one of your stories has like 20 yeah. endnotes. Um, that's obviously a, a decision that the stories are going to have this kind of apparatus to, to explain them. But that seems to me to say something about what this book is for and who this book is for. I'm assuming these stories when they were published in Bangla, in this country, did not have that. No, no, no. So is that, is, is that, I mean, what can we interpret from the fact that there are things in there that are, that are given this kind of a... Well, my, my answer is that, yes, you're right. The attempt here is not just to produce a work of literature, but also through it enable uh, an understanding of the culture and the geography and the history of the city. And in that case, certain, there are certain gaps in factual information that need to be filled, which perhaps just the reading of a work of fiction might not necessitate, or you can trust the reader to go out and find out on their own. But in this case, it made sense to uh, fill that gap and, and you know, complete the picture. At least that was the way I looked at it. But I'm not a fan of endnotes myself. I think it was also uh, partly a stylistic choice. I think all the book of... The, the city books that mm. uh, Rob produces oh. does have this sort of style. Yeah. And um, the story that I did, which has uh, over almost a page of endnotes, it's uh, based on the Liberation War, which has a lot of, you know, um, words that are sort of, uh, like say, Kanchena, which has connotations that are cultural, that are also emotional. So um, you couldn't really take it out of the text, but sure. also not convey that. You couldn't assume yeah. that readers would know that. Exactly. Yeah. It, it kind of comes back, though, to, to what Kaiser and I were talking about at the very beginning about what the function of this book is. 
because in some ways, what I said, what you were describing was the book, which was a product of this curious process. But also, we know that it has this other effect, which is it makes people in one part of the world begin to understand life in another part of the world. The English-speaking world in the UK and the US is not full of people who know Bangladeshi literature, is not full of people who know Dhaka, is not full of people who understand the tradition any of these stories are coming from. Is it, Kaiser, is it, I don't know, is it too grand to suggest that this book is also making a kind of statement about the way in which these stories travel? Um, it, <coughs> in the, in the, the stories themselves? Or the, the stories themselves, but also the, the very fact that a collaboration between organizations and people here and in the UK has mm -hmm. resulted in stories about this city which is not yeah. known to a lot of people in the yeah. UK. Well, are coming to readers. Yeah. I will give the, I will give copies mm. of this book to my friends Quite. who, for mm. whom in many cases, it'll be the first time they've read a story mm. from this country. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, the Western reader is not familiar with Bangladeshi literature at all. So, um, to start with, I think you do need uh, the help of apparatus like the uh, EndNote. Mm. But um, if, as we hope will happen, you know, Bangladeshi literature gets to be better known in the West, I think will gradually sort of uh, dispense with a lot of these. And um, in general, I think <coughs> glossaries have become uh, quite redundant nowadays because of the internet. Mm -hmm. You can Google anything and you can you will get an explanation. So, and that's quicker than actually going to the, to the end of the book to look up a, to a, a net often, you know? So, um, yes, I think and again, another thing is that, well, to start with, when you are just introducing a literature uh, to a, a foreign audience, it's almost like ethnography. Hmm. You know, because it's something strange. It comes from a remote place that they hear about only when there's a disaster. Mm -hmm. And here you have uh, a complete world, you know, sort of social relationships, you know, uh, certain uh, uh, structures of feeling, you know, in, in the culture, and all these things um, have to be conveyed somehow. And uh, to, to start with, you know, I think um, you have to be sort of uh, pay special attention to the problems that a foreign reader may face you know, in encountering mm -hmm. uh, a strange new literature. Um, let's but, see it also, how, yeah. but it also comes back to the thing you were saying uh, a, a short while ago about these things all being together and what you're presenting to these new readers isn't individual stories no. or an individual story. It's these 10 things that yes. are collectively yes. In a fact, picture a, of something. A sort of a rounded picture of uh, the city as it has been over several decades. Mm -hmm. So you get a sense of the uh, historical turmoil that uh, has, uh, this city has undergone, and also the social fabric, the um, social and individual problems that people are facing on a daily basis, you see. So, yeah, it's a kind of a, an attempt to uh, do something impossible. <laughs> in, you know, in a short book of just 10 stories, you know, it's really impossible to uh, present uh, a, a city of uh, 20 million people <laughs> had a very turbulent ride over the last yeah. few decades. I wonder how, how that, that project feels to a writer where presumably when you wrote The Weapon, you weren't thinking this is part of a project to be part of a greater thing where there are these stories that are connected but unconnected. Yeah, one day someone will do the Book of Dhaka and then I'll be ready for them. Can you say something about then what it's, what it's like having your story, which is you know, a beautifully constructed, isolated thing, but it's also somehow now, it's, it's found these nine friends, right? And it's in this interesting conversation exactly. with these nine other. Now, a city, ha a city is a soft city, and the city is a hard city. The hard city belongs to the architectural uh, structure of this city, uh, engineering the roads, bridges, and all these things, shopping centers. But the soft city is imaginary. People relate to each other, communities grow, children play in, this, in the streets, and then people dream, daydream, jaywalk, 
all these kinds of thing, things make the soft city, which you carry with you. And on that level, you can relate to any city in the world. Mm -hmm. Like I read the book of Khartoum. I've never been to the city, probably will never be in my life. But I could relate to every story because it touched me, those stories. Uh, there is a story of an old man who reminisces about the childhood he had spent in the city without crossing over into any of the cities, mega cities of the world. I can vividly understand, imagine what it is like living in a city which keeps changing, changing its geography. Now, Raincoat, which Pushpita has uh, translated, took place in uh, 1971, and mine about 1990, mm -hmm. 30, 40, 50 years. Dhaka has changed drastically. Roads are gone. Historical markers are all gone. The city is in turmoil. It's a very dynamic but restless, changing city. One thing will never change is the imaginary those nostalgic memories of past. So I believe that a city is built on many things. One of these is memory. So when I wrote uh, that story, I believe that I have taken from certain elements from that collective memory <coughs> in which a child gets lost in the city, and then that's a tragedy for a family. That constitutes the software, or let's say the folklore of a city. And I believe that that way, one city can always connect with another city. Although, externally, the hard city, mm -hmm. it cannot connect Philadelphia with uh, Dhaka. But that book also I read, Ra has edited that. Mm -hmm. And that Philadelphia tells you not about the structures, you know, tall buildings and all these things, but about people. And the, the lives they live under the shadows of big corporations all those money, uh, blood-sucking instruments of power, mm -hmm. and how they struggle continuously. That is something that I believe uh, which, which connects all my stories and the stories we have. And one question you asked in the beginning is whether in London and French, uh, you have urban models and other different Most of my relationship with French is set in the villages. Because the villages have a huge presence in London. Festival time, almost half of the city empties itself. Everyone makes a beeline for the villages. Mm -hmm. The roots are there. But increasingly, we are becoming urban. And maybe in, in the next few years, you'll keep seeing the urban literature proliferating. But as long as they do not detach themselves from the gate imagination which connect, pe connects people, they will be valid. I suppose the the question that comes from that, and I don't even know who, who to ask this question because it's an impossible one, so I will just ask it and see who's going to be brave or foolish and try and answer it. But it's a question about what the function of, of fiction is. Because what you were describing when you were talking about reading, for example, the book of Khartoum, is very much my experience reading the book of Dhaka. The first in this series I read was the book of Rio, and Rio is a city I know very well. I've subsequently read others and books that I, about cities I don't know at all. When Kaiser was talking about this sense that bringing books kind of across borders and across the world, we think of it as having this kind of ethnographic function. I recognize that as a, as a kind of publishing conversation, but actually from a reader's point of view, what seems to me to be the beauty of a book like this is almost the opposite of that that actually, whether you learn about Dhaka or not from this book, it seems more or less irrelevant, because actually what you get from the book is stories of people who are in love or who are afraid or who are happy or who are sad, and what you get is, this is what fiction is for. Someone's gonna answer that. Yeah, there we go. The nature of fiction, go on. Kais is gonna tell yeah. us about the nature I of think, fiction. I you think know, um, you, um, you are sort of, uh, suddenly taken a sort of platonic leap, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's this kind of... Uh, yeah, good luck. Know, fictiveness is conveyed. <laughs> but that it's, it's always uh, you know, anchored in specific uh, social, mm. uh, cultural realities. But there's, a reason, but there's a reason that I'm able to enjoy these stories yes, and connect to these people, yeah. or you're able to connect to the book of Khartoum. Yeah, because, I mean, you, 
through those, you do get that, that uh, something universal. Yes. But that universal thing is not something that um, exists beyond this world, as it were, in the transcendental realm. No. It's always uh, located in, in the sort of specificities of a particular place and culture. So, and then learning to appreciate the universal in those specificities, I think, is what leads to true uh, mutual understanding. That you know, a person may be wearing a lungi and you know a kurta, and, but um, what is going through is universal. But the lungi and the kurta are also an essential part of his uh, persona. You know, mm. so. Uh, and uh, the more we uh, learn to sort of uh, see the universal in the, uh, within the specificities, I think the better it is for uh, a literary. So the, the, specif uh, the specificity is, is inevitable. Yes. And it's also valuable. I mean, this is slightly summarizing what is the thing that makes Shakespeare a great writer. Mm -hmm. One of the things is to do with a kind of specificity. Yeah. Um, but our experience of these things as readers mm -hmm. is... Isn't it extraordinary that you read it the is, darker yes. book or the cartoon that book or whatever? The universal and all. The two become conflated. Yes. Mm. And it is that what, which makes art and literature, you know? Not just the, yeah. the, the, the transcending. Yeah, I, I, I remember what you know, the writer Nadeem Aslam once said at Jaipur, and I thought he was, it was great. He said, great fiction takes you into a space which you never knew existed, but when you're there, you say, this is it. This is where I want to be. I'm not going to attempt to answer your question, but um, what I liked Coward. about the book personally is um, I think it also gives um, a nice uh, journey through the different types of fiction. I, you know, I'm, I'm stretching it a bit. Like my story, the first story is a, a stream of consciousness story. There are very dialogue-based stories. I feel there's elements of surrealism in some of the stories. There's fantasy in the other stories. His story is very much following the oral tradition. So I think it's also a journey through the different types of fiction, mm -hmm. which I found really interesting. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, we have a little over. Sorry, were you? No. Um, one, one thought just crossed my mind. I mean, as our pro project develops and as more Bangladeshi uh, works get translated, and if if they do find uh, a readership, uh, then I, I wonder what effect uh, uh, it will have on the writer in Bangladesh, because. I mean, um, a writer always has an audience in mind. I mean, one is a very real audience, like, you know, the, he knows that the editor is a friend of his, and there are some friends who are going to read his story as soon as it comes out. And then there's the potential audience, which is also a very real presence, that I hope that it'll reach all these people. Mm. That, that the horizon is going to expand, I think. And so the writer will then think not only of the reader in Bangladesh, in the Bengali-speaking world, in the West Bengal, Tripura, uh, the subcontinent, but also the, the, the Western world, the world as a whole. Um, Could that be a bad thing? I mean, might, might that be a bad thing? Sorry? Might that be a bad thing? No, that, 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 that's the writers have, have a about. sense that, that I mean, the book has to be how, palatable to... Yes, how it, the writer sort of uh, responds to this awareness of the large audience uh, it can be a problem in some cases, like, you know, you, then the, the, there may be a tendency to produce something, you know, the lowest common denominator which mm -hmm. will appeal to everybody, and uh, then you, one might start thinking about, uh, you know, the, um, the, the, the demands of the market, you know, like, I mean, a, a novel uh, about a contemporary, uh, about a contemporary Muslim society, um, given to a Western publisher, you know, the publisher may just get back and say, you don't have a few fundamentalists, you know? <laughs> so put, the, put a few in, you know? <laughs> Otherwise it won't sell. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing I'm worried about. That, you know, the, the, the sort of dynamics of a particular story may not require a, a fundamentalist, you see? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a story about something else. But the market out there may force the writer to sort of change in this way. Or to, or to lose some of that specificity we talked about, uh, 
by writing the kind of story that doesn't need 20 endnotes because you're assuming that your readership is going to, that you're not going to put anything in there that's going to be in any way n new, frankly, to a The, to the a Murakamiization of... So Murakami basically yeah. writing for the New Yorker. Yeah. Yeah. That's the idea. Yeah. Yes, we're all, we're all thinking of Murakami at this point, yeah. who basically writes for, for, for the New Yorker. Um, we have uh, about 10 minutes left for you to ask questions. I so wonder I'm if you could just briefly have the translators and authors, yes? So, uh, who, who, who are the yes. other, who are the people who... Yeah, I suppose the authors in presentation yeah. should be... The authors... We're going to make you, um, you stand. Yeah, Shaheen Akhtar gonna... is here, I think. <coughs> Shaheen. And the translators. So no, I, if, you, if you'll give us a moment, we're just trying to... <coughs> Shaheen Appa, would you like would to... Would you please come up? Yeah. Shaheen is the writer who subjected herself Oh, oh, that to was that you. grueling <laughs> process yeah, she, in the first yeah, uh, she workshop. Used to, she used to look different. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say the first time I did one of these workshops, I was running the workshop, and we had a Portuguese writer uh, who was with us for the week, and he had just uh, he had just stopped smoking, and by the end of the week he'd taken it up again. <laughs> Absolutely swear. Within four days, he was a smoker again. This is what we did. But you look surprisingly, surprisingly kind of still here. <laughs> would, you, would you mind saying something about what the, what the experience was like? Would you pass the... I think we we surprised someone. No, no. Our golpo to ekta achhe. Can sir Bangla bolchi? To golpo ta. আমি লিখেছি বেশ আগে তো এটা একটা ডাইরেক্ট এক্সপেরিয়েন্সের বিষয় ছিল তার একজন মাসাজ করে একজন মহিলা ঢাকা শহরে বিভিন্ন মহিলাদের সাথে তার ইন্টারেকশান হয় সে আপার ক্লাস গুলশান এরিয়া তারপরে আর্মি এরিয়া যেটা খুব সিকিওর্ড তারপরে আবার মিডিল ক্লাস এরিয়া এবং বিভিন্ন মেয়েদের সাথে ইন্টারেকশানে শহরের একটা চেহারা উঠে আসা তো সেরকমই ছিল আমার কি পয়েন্ট যেটা ছিল গল্পে সেটা হলো যে মিস কল একটা ফোন আছে কিন্তু সে মিস কলই দেয় কারণ পয়সা লাগে তার তো মিস কলটা একটা বড় বিষয় ছিল আর সেই মাসাজ করে যে তার বিষয়টা ছিল যে সে একটা ইয়ে কমিউনিটি থেকে আসা একসময় ওরা মাইগ্রে ব্রিটিশ পিরিয়ডে মাইগ্রেটের হয়েছিল বাংলাদেশে এবং সেটা বিহারের ইউপির কিছু জায়গার থেকে যেটা নাম ওরা জানে না মাঝে মধ্যে বলে যে বালিয়া গোরখপুর হ্যাঁ এরকম তো সেইটা আমি জানি না অনেকক্ষণ কথা হচ্ছিল যে আসলে ট্রান্সলেশান দিয়ে যে কিভাবে কমিউনিকেট করা তা আমরা যারা সাধারণত আমাদের থাকে যে বাংলায় লিখছি বাংলার পাঠক এবং তারা অনেক কিছুই জানে আমাদের কালচার নিয়ে ইভেন সেই মহিলা যে ব্যাকগ্রাউন্ড থেকে এসছে তো সেটা ট্রান্সলেটারের বিষয়ে আর অনেকক্ষণ আলোচনা হলো এডিটরদের মধ্যে যে সেগুলো কীভাবে আসবে তা আমার গল্প সম্পর্কেই থ্যাংক ইউ থ্যাংক ইউ থ্যাংক ইউ সো ইউ Um, yes, yeah, so Shaina Pa spoke about her, the story of her, that's her, the story of her, that's her, the Sioux who goes from house to house offering her services and, the, and she travels different, through different parts of the city and the key element of her life is the missed call because she doesn't have enough money to call her clients so she calls them and disconnects and then they call her back and tell her when they want her and of course there are clashes and there are conflicts and it goes into her life and traces her ancestry and the fact that her family had actually migrated from what is now India um, to what is now Bangladesh many years ago. And, and it ends with her again going on her way. <coughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Is there someone else? Um, who, uh, there's, there's a hand up over is there. Is Parvez here? Mm. Uh, mm. And some of the translators are here. Yes. Will you just introduce? Pushpita is come, come. sitting here. Pushpita, yes. And uh, we have Arifa, Arifa and we have Marzia. Please. Oh. 
and ye Marzia. Uh, and Marzia Rahman, I have translated the story. Helal was on his way to meet Reshma. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm Arifa. I translated Shaheen up as a uh, story. Uh, it's called Home in the book. Uh, the original story was Astan. Hello, I'm Swedha Nuri Raihan. I have translated Rashida Sultana's Jononi, and it's called Mother in the, in the Book of Taka. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's a gentleman there. Thank you. I am Muhammad Shafiqul Islam. I translated Bipradash Borua's The Father and the Princess. It was an exciting experience. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's, it's great to Anyone have all of you with us. Hiding at we the had back. a question. Would you have, uh, was, there, was there a question, gentleman there? Actually, I have a question about translation that you guys mentioned that you don't read ahead before you're translating. So there are two ways of translating. One is direct translating, which is like literary. Another one is you, you know, take the essence, you, um, you know, feel it, and from the whole sense and idea of it, you translate it, which probably works for more of a poetry. Because one of my friends works for Classical Music Association asked me, do you know a translator who can translate the spiritual and the folk songs? So, which are very, very difficult in lyrics and uh, very, uh, I would say, complicated to translate in English or any other language. So I couldn't really answer how to do that because that probably would take someone who is also poetic in a sense to mm. deliver that kind of essence in it. So that is one question, how do you translate that? And my another comment uh, towards uh, the suspicion about if we have an international audience, how would it change our writing? That is, I would want to quote one of the greatest writers and filmmakers, Sotrajit Rai. He said, Shodeshi hotche shopcheveshi antorjatik, which means local is the most international. And I see all these upcoming Indian young writers, very brilliant, like one of the, Arvinda, I think, wrote White Tiger. They all have absolutely local, you know, essence in it. They mm -hmm. are not trying to please the West, but that makes it so much more powerful. So I hope our young writers will, you know, try to be original in that sense. <laughs> and uh, if we understand Western literature, why would they not understand us? That's a very good point. Thank you very much. Aranava or, or Kashmir, do you want to say, do you want to answer the first question? Um, well, I, I'm not sure exactly what you want to know. Do you mean, uh, well, in our case, since this was prose, as you pointed out, it is what you call direct translation, which is with great uh, fidelity to the original in terms of words, vocabulary, tone, sentences, phrases, as much as possible, as much as is possible without sounding like alien in, the, in, in English. Right? Would you say that? But this doesn't mean that that other thing, which is to do with the feeling of something, the feeling of a piece of writing, the spirit of it, you're not completely dismissing that and saying all I'm trying to do is maintain one thing. No, no, not at all. But but I think it's I think it's yeah. a, it, this kind of separating way, the way we translate prose and poetry yeah. is is slightly misleading because actually is, yes. prose that is artful has a lot of the same challenges if Absolutely. you care about rhythm and if you care about voice and if you care about cadence and if you care about all those things. Absolutely, absolutely. It's just that maybe with poetry there are a few more constraints in terms of sometimes rhyme and number of syllables and so on, which may need you to play with the words a little bit more than you would need to in prose. Um, with fiction and with great writing, uh, the words can convey all the things, all the intangibles as well. Certainly. Also, I think uh, <clears throat> the... Um particular uh, sort of texts that he mentioned uh, that he, he was trying to get translated, they are um, esoteric in nature, I mean, certain spiritual uh, yeah. songs. So there, I mean, that, you, that is a very special case because, uh, you know, they have their own um, esoteric philosophy, which is uh, some, um, which gets in, in, in into the language of the lyrics but not in a very uh, obvious way. So there's, there's the hidden meanings and all those things. So, uh, I mean, that's a totally different <coughs> question, really. Uh, we have time for one. Did you have a question in the, in the second? If you should wait for the microphone to come to you. Uh, we've lost the microphone. Just here in the second row on the aisle, please. A short story has five important elements, setting, character, plot, theme, and conflict. 
My question is about on setting. The Victorian writer, uh, writer Thomas Hardy's setting is one kind, and whereas modern writer uh, Catherine Mansfield's setting is applied to bring. What is the difference between in, in the settings of Catherine Mansfield's setting and, and Thomas Hardy's? No, uh, no, that's a different thing. I, I believe you are talking about the importance of setting. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have noticed, all the ten stories are set in Dhaka, but setting it is, it's, itself is not enough. It, it's just a place which gives you an ambience, a space in which characters move around. But more important elements of a story are how you are being true to life experience. And that's one uh, comment that I really appreciate, that you must be true to the local. I don't believe, don't believe in playing for the gallery. <laughs> Writing for a particular Western audience's mind would probably introduce a, an element of facetiousness in your story which will sink it. So it cannot exoticize your setting for the sake of some readers out there. You have to be true to the ambience, the, the feelings, the sense, the feng shui, the, the Chinese say it, isn't it? That's what is important. So different writers treat settings different ways. That's the standard. If you read our literature, the same thing. Uh, setting is never one constant. It varies, changes over time. And some stories might not even have a setting. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's take a very quick question from the young man here. We're okay. almost out of time. Does urban narrative or narrative of the urban has always to do with the cities, the location of the cities? Because can't you understand urban itself as a stylistical device or a narrative trope rather than a story of the city? Because if we can understand location as a translocationality, which is more, if we just if we just if city juxtaposed against the reality, which is not dynamic and urbanity as a dynamic. So in this informational age of this, in this inter, in the age of internet of things, can't you understand that soft narrative of the urban, the, the sub-superstructural, post-infrastructural narrative of the urban within the stylistic device of locating urbanity as a process, not a product? That's a, I take it as a comment. Uh, so it doesn't mm. need to be responded to. It's a good comment you made. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry, we are out of time now. I'm sorry for those of you who still have a couple of hands still up there. We have to finish on time because there'll be something else coming in here very shortly. Thank you for coming. I do very strongly encourage you to grab hold of a copy of this if you haven't got one already and read it. It's a brilliant book full of great stories. But before you do that, do please join me in thanking our lovely speakers today. Thank you, Danny.